There is very little to Barbie beyond its political messaging. I am unable to analyse Barbie as a film without talking about feminism, because that is what the film is, overtly political. This is unfortunate because as soon as my opinion on feminism, for example, becomes a part of the video, the video itself also becomes political. As a rule, I generally try to look past politics in films because I am far more concerned with whether or not a film tells a compelling and coherent story with characters I can engage with and understand. If a film is fantastically written and presented, but has a message that I personally find hard to take seriously, then I try my very best to be as open as possible so that my own preconceptions don't get in the way of my enjoyment of the film. It serves no one for me to simply complain about feminism and then conclude that Barbie is a bad film, because I personally feel feminists are at best misguided and at worst regressive self-victimizing degenerates. That is not the kind of analysis I am interested in, because although I do like a good spicy joke here and there, I do try not to be an anti-feminist ideologue. This is the same reason why I avoid accusing anything of being woke, because that word is unbelievably toxic and politically charged, it seems to have entirely different definitions depending on whether you are pro or anti-woke, and it just ends up polluting the discussion and distracting from the questions I am most interested in. Is the film good? Is the film bad? And why? There is a discussion to be had about Barbie beyond it is feminist propaganda, even though having now distilled my thoughts into this video, I am at this point entirely sympathetic to those who have described this film as such. I won't be doing that myself, however, because I would prefer not to be quite as divisive and exaggerated as Barbie is. If Barbie is feminist propaganda, maybe it's really well-made feminist propaganda. The question as to whether or not it is feminist propaganda is entirely separate to the question as to whether or not it is a functional movie with coherent characters, a consistent thematic throughline, and comprehensible world-building. It is, at the end of the day, a film, a piece of entertainment, and although it may have a very specific mentality driving it forwards, there is a movie somewhere underneath all that. So rather than make the same mistake Barbie made, to preach to the choir of feminists about how the evil patriarchy makes their lives hell, I will not be preaching to the choir of… uh, you guys. I am not going to complain about how the film is woke. I am not going to complain about how the film is offensive. I am not going to complain about how much I personally found the film to be frustrating to watch. I am instead going to explain to you why the characters and the world building in particular are laughably insufficient, why the film's attempts at comedy actually work against its unbelievably blunt social commentary, and ultimately why it did a terrible job of communicating what it very clearly wanted to communicate by repeatedly undermining its own message, and as a result has very little coherent to say about anything. With that said, who is Barbie made for? Well, if you believe that the world is run by evil, vindictive, and unintelligent men who all collectively decided that they need to do a patriarchy so as to keep women in the kitchen while they do all the important things, then this film is going to be telling you exactly what you want to hear, and you may well thoroughly enjoy it purely on that basis. It is also a flashy, vibrant, and dynamic film with A-list actors, a heartwarming feel-good plot, some jokes that occasionally land, and some topical social commentary to make it seem relevant. If, however, you do not believe in the five pillars of feminism, then Barbie is probably going to be extremely difficult to sit through because the film assumes that the viewer already agrees with its premise. It does not attempt to convince. Given the target audience, my presumption is that the vast majority of audience members will already agree with the film's messaging. Imagine, however, being a vegetarian and watching a film whose premise is Vegetarians are sickly, decrepit weirdos, let's make fun of them. Imagine being a Christian and watching a film whose premise is Christianity makes zero logical sense, long live atheism. Imagine being a Donald Trump fan and watching Don't Look Up. I am neither a vegetarian, nor am I a Christian, nor am I a fan of Donald Trump, but in both of those hypothetical cases, as well as the unfortunately very real Don't Look Up, if those movies were delivered with the same lack of nuance or subtlety as Barbie, I would find them equally obnoxious and repugnant, regardless of whether or not I agree with their premise. The central message of this film seems to be that men and women are engaged in an eternal battle to subjugate each other, and in the case of Barbie, the women are victorious, and so continue to subjugate the men. You may be thinking, wait, I saw the film, that isn't what happens. The film ends with them all deciding to live as equals. Well, dear viewer, I will be getting to that, but for now you will have to take my word on this. Anyway, without being too hyperbolic, this is a message that I think any sane individual, man or woman, should find abhorrent. 
And this kind of thing is what people are referring to when they describe this film as feminist propaganda. I would have thought that any rational person would be cognizant of the fact that the path to human flourishing and happiness requires the cooperation of both men and women, rather than one ruling over the other. However, given this film's success at the box office, it would seem rational people are hard to come by. Nevertheless, as much as it pains me to say this, the message of a film being disgusting and misguided does not necessarily mean that the film is poorly written or otherwise bad. The 1915 film Birth of a Nation is a notoriously racist movie with reprehensible messaging, but that doesn't change the fact that it was a groundbreaking film at the time, at least in terms of technical achievement. So whilst I do try my best to ignore politics in movies because it generally doesn't actually affect the quality of the film, in the case of Barbie I am not so sure that is the case because the ideology takes centre stage, whereas things like world building and coherent character development are aggressively avoided. Barbie is a film written by a woman who evidently seems to think that a man showing a woman how to do something is some unforgivable slight. Barbie is a film written by a woman who thinks that a man who works out and has a mini-fridge is deplorable and worthy of being mocked. Barbie is a film written by a woman who thinks women don't have any power and that men are standing in the way of their liberation. Barbie is a film written by a woman who seems to be aware that women have unique struggles in society that are specific to them, but doesn't seem to know what any of them are. So, is there anything worthwhile in Barbie? Yeah, not much. The sets were nice and vibrant and appropriately plasticky. Watching Ryan Gosling take the piss out of himself was occasionally amusing. There are many Easter eggs for Barbie fans that will have gone right over my head. Both of the Ryan Gosling musical numbers were excellent. There were two cameos that made my brain go, oh, look, it's that person. Additionally, the film opens with a mildly amusing parody of the opening of 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which Barbie appears to a group of children playing with baby dolls, and they then smash the babies to pieces, symbolically embracing the arrival of the hot new toy, Barbie. Given the feminist themes, I was expecting this to be the setup for an overt anti-motherhood payoff by the ending, but I was surprised to find that the film does not seem to be anti-motherhood outside of this scene. Or, perhaps put another way, there are anti-motherhood themes that are present, but there are also pro-motherhood themes that are equally present. Which is just one example of this film not having a clue about what it actually wants to say. The girls who played with them could only ever play at being mothers, which can be fun. At least for a while, anyway. We mothers stand still so our daughters can look back to see how far they've come. Maybe this was my fault and this opening scene has nothing to do with being anti-motherhood, but in my defense this scene featured a group of children smashing baby dolls into the dirt. Anyway, with the good bits out of the way, let's dig into what doesn't work about Barbie. One quick note before I start, the film takes place in two separate worlds. Barbie Land and The Real World. To avoid confusion, when I use the term the real world, I am referring to Barbie's absurd exaggerated parody of the reality in which we live. If I use the term reality, I am referring to actual out-of-universe reality. This may sound needlessly confusing, but the real world and reality are not at all similar. And the reason for this confusion is that the writer's use of the term real world is a misnomer. They have created a perverse bastardization of reality and called it the real world in order to obfuscate the fact that these two things are not the same whatsoever. So to start with, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the world we are presented with in the opening few minutes. Simply put, it is utter nonsense that is hand-waved to allow the film to make the points that it wants to make. Barbie Land seems to exist on some other plane of existence, or at least I think it does. The film is deliberately vague and occasionally contradictory as to the exact nature of Barbie Land. Is Barbie Land like an alternate reality or is it like a place where uh, your imagination is? Yeah. And you can only enter or leave Barbie Land under very specific circumstances that I will explain later. Barbie Land seems to be an analogue for kids playing with Barbie dolls in the real world, kind of like in the Lego movie. So for example, when a car crashes it will fly all over the place as if a child was playing with a Barbie car in the real world. Or sometimes Barbies will float around as if an invisible child's hand is moving them from their house to their car. 
This happens very infrequently, and thankfully it never affects the plot. There are no deus ex machina moments that are facilitated by impossible things happening that are then justified by saying, oh, a child was playing with the Barbie, so that's why it happened. I assume that there is only one copy of each type of Barbie and Ken within Barbie Land, and that therefore each Barbie or Ken functions as a representation of all versions of that Barbie or Ken that exists in the real world. This is never stated, but I think it is reasonable to assume, given that we never see anything to suggest otherwise. Life in Barbie Land is not exactly… life. There are repeated gags whereby the Barbies and Kens have very limited interactions with the various things in Barbie Land, due to the fact that these limitations would have been present in the toys that Barbie Land is based on. When Barbie has a shower, there is no water. When she drinks something, there is no liquid in the glass. It is implied that every single day in Barbie Land follows almost the exact same routine, at least until the events of the film. No explanation is ever given as to what Barbie Land is or why it exists. We just have to assume that when the original Barbie doll was invented by Mattel, there was suddenly a Barbie Land. It isn't a place that Mattel built in some far off corner of the world. It just exists somewhere, I guess. More importantly, however, no explanation is ever given as to why the sentient Barbies and Kens that inhabit Barbie Land exist. They simply do, in order to allow the filmmakers to make their point. All we get is, as the narrator tells us, she might have started out as a lady in a bathing suit, but she became so much more. She has her own money, her own house, her own car, her own career. Which one could assume to be symbolic, but it turns out that this is all very literal. We also see that Barbie Land is entirely run by the Barbies, whereas the Kens just seem to stand around not doing anything. I am unsure how accurate this idea that the Kens are useless nobodies is, given that the film is supposedly an adaptation of, or expansion of, a pre-existing line of toys. But because I am neither well versed in Barbie lore, nor am I particularly interested in adaptation arguments, I will continue. When I say the Barbies run Barbie Land, I need to be clear about what exactly the film is telling us because it isn't quite as simple as it first appears. Women hold all major positions of power, control all the money. Basically everything that men do in your world, women do in ours. The various Barbies have jobs, including delivering mail, highway maintenance, being the president, writing books, being lawyers, flying airplanes, being astronauts. You get the idea. Because Barbie can be anything. Barbie Land is a society run by women. Except that it absolutely is not, because it is not a society. This is not some pocket dimension, this is not Narnia. This is not a normal place inhabited by normal people with needs and desires and autonomy that just so happens to be run by women. The best explanation that I can give as to the nature of Barbie Land is that it is an extremely vague alternate universe that physically mirrors or represents what happens when children play with Barbies. We have already seen that Barbies float through the air occasionally because that is what happens when children play with dolls. We also see one particularly unfortunate Barbie that has been disfigured as a result of being played with too much. With one exception, the Barbies do not seem to be aware that they are being played with. Additionally, many of their physical movements are the same as those of dolls. They also do not eat or drink. We later learn that they cannot cry, which also suggests that any kind of intensely negative emotion is entirely alien to them, meaning that the Barbies don't actually run anything because they are not sentient nor are they even alive. They are toys that are magically connected to the real world somehow, and for some reason that is never even hand-waved let alone explained, they are seemingly conscious. So the Barbies do not run Barbie Land by virtue of the fact that they are women. This is not a society where the women rose to the top because, unlike in the real world, the men were not conspiring to keep them down. The Barbies run Barbie Land, and the Kens stand around making fools of themselves, because that is obviously what a little girl would do with her Barbie and Ken dolls. That is what the film is telling us, and in isolation that concept is perfectly fine and is almost certainly true to life. Where this falls apart is when the film goes on to draw parallels between Barbie Land and the real world. The film seems to suggest that Barbie Land is some kind of idyllic paradise where, as the narrator directly says, all of the problems of feminism and equal rights have been solved. Which conceptually doesn't work whatsoever, because the inhabitants of Barbie Land do not actually seem to be in control of their actions. Unless, of course, the film is suggesting that the reason Barbie Land has solved equal rights is because Barbie Land is a parallel for children playing with dolls, meaning that children were able to solve the issues of equal rights by playing with dolls. 
suggesting that solving the issues of equal rights is extremely easy, and meaning that all of the Barbies running the show and the Kens being brainless yes-men is the film's idea of solving equal rights. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. None of which really follows logically, and perhaps more importantly, none of which aligns at all with the social commentary that the film molests its audience with throughout the rest of its runtime. The reason Barbie leaves Barbie Land and enters the real world is also hand-waved extremely quickly so as to allow the filmmakers to tell their story. Just as they didn't explain or contextualize what Barbie Land is in relation to the real world, they also don't provide any coherent reason for Barbie to go to the real world. She simply must, because the real world is where all of that juicy social commentary is. We are told that as a result of Barbie's existential crisis, both she and the person playing with her in the real world have opened a portal, and now there is a rip in the continuum that is the membrane between Barbie Land and the real world. This concept of course contradicts my earlier hypothesis about how this particular Barbie, stereotypical Barbie as she is referred to, is a Barbie Land representation of all stereotypical Barbie toys in the real world. How can she be expected to find the one person playing with her if she represents potentially millions of pieces of plastic in the real world? She can't. Which means that either this is a plot hole, or that every single Barbie and Ken doll in the real world has a duplicate in Barbie Land. Which would make the population of Barbie Land well over a billion. Which is not at all supported by what we see. Barbie is then told that in order to resolve her existential crisis and return to being stereotypical Barbie, she has to fix this rip in the continuum. If she doesn't, she will get fat, sad, mushy, and complicated. We are then told that there actually isn't a portal, the portal was a figure of speech, and that the portal is actually a sports car, a speedboat, a rocket, a bike, a campervan, a snowmobile, and a rollerblades. What is happening? I hope you are following along because I am sure as shit not. Barbie is then told that she has to go to the real world to find the child playing with her. Why exactly she needs to do this, I have no idea. The explanation we get is that the girl who's playing with you must be sad, and her thoughts and feelings and humanness are interfering with your dullness. So before I continue, the film seems to be suggesting that the reason Barbie is experiencing her existential crisis is because the humanness of the person playing with her is being transferred to her. Suggesting that being fat, sad, mushy, complicated, and plagued with thoughts of death is what it is to be a woman. Which is a pretty nihilistic, pessimistic, and honestly pathetic way to view the world, but okay. There is also no explanation given as to what Barbie is supposed to do when she finds the person playing with her. Are we meant to assume Barbie is supposed to snap her fingers and cure this person's evidently severe mental health crisis? Anyway, Barbie questions why the person playing with her in the real world would be sad, saying, We fixed everything so that women in the real world could be happy and powerful. This, plus the fact that Weird Barbie referred to her as having dullness, means that Barbie knows that she is a toy, but moments earlier she didn't seem to be aware that she was being played with. My presumption here is that the reason why Barbie didn't know she was being played with was so as to allow Weird Barbie to explain to the audience that all the Barbies in Barbie Land are being played with in the real world. Despite the fact that she seems to be fully aware of what a Barbie doll is and the supposed impact the Barbie doll has had in the real world, not to mention the fact that every now and then she will levitate from her house to her car. Or, in other words, she forgets things that she already knows to allow for some exposition. Pretty pathetic, huh? This scene also contains what I assume is intended to be comedy, but it falls completely flat because it has nothing to do with either of the characters present. Weird Barbie just does a Morpheus parody from The Matrix, despite the fact that Weird Barbie cannot know what The Matrix is because she lives in Barbie Land, which is on a separate plane of existence to the one where The Matrix was released in 1999. And then Barbie picks the wrong option and then they argue for a bit. And I am told this scene was very funny, but I just wanted to go and stick my nuts on a train track. Anyway, as I mentioned before, the method of leaving Barbie Land is by traveling via a list of wacky forms of transportation. Why does it work this way? Best if you don't think about it too much. How does anyone know that it works this way? Best if you don't think about it too much. Is it only possible to get in the car, the rocket, the bike, etc. to leave Barbie Land when there has been a rip in the membrane between Barbie Land and the real world caused by a sad person playing with a Barbie? Best if you don't think about it too much. What happens if you drive or walk down the road that leads out of Barbie Land when there isn't someone sad in the real world? Best if you don't think about it. 
Anyway, so the outcome of this scene is that Barbie learns that she has to travel through the metaphorical portal that only exists when someone plays with a Barbie while sad in order to get to the real world so that she can cure this person's terminal sadness so that she doesn't get infected with humanness. Um, I can certainly tell where the writer's priorities were when writing this script, because it certainly wasn't the world building. Immediately after arriving in the real world, Barbie is repeatedly harassed verbally and physically by almost literally every man she encounters. Because this is what it is like being a woman, don't you know? You cannot walk down the street without every man within a three mile radius objectifying you, slapping your ass, wolf whistling, asking you to smile, or making lewd remarks. And yes, obviously harassment does happen, but Barbie dials it up so high that it goes past being an exaggerated joke and ends up coming off like social commentary delivered with a sledgehammer. Which maybe should be the tagline for this film. I may not be a woman, but I am well acquainted with some, occasionally going so far as to speak to them whenever I can pry myself out of my basement, and I also have 31 years of experience being alive in reality, so I can safely say that Barbie's real world, as anything approximating reality, is so cartoonishly exaggerated and divisive that I fail to see how anyone can take it seriously. It very much seems as though the writers decided to create a parody of reality, so that all their complaints about how hard it is being a woman would be validated in a way that they may not be in actual reality, and in so doing they have completely undermined any legitimate comments that they wanted to make about society's expectations of women. And to make this worse, during the prior scene where Barbie is told that she has to go to the real world, from out of nowhere, Weird Barbie says, that Ken of yours, he is one nice looking little protein pot. I'd like to see what kind of nude blob he's packing under those jeans. Um, I might be giving the writers too much credit here, but I think the purpose of this is that at this point in the film, the writers are treating Barbie Land as an inversion of the real world, in that the women are running everything instead of the men. Where the real world is a patriarchal utopia, Barbie Land is a feminist utopia. The reason Weird Barbie makes inappropriate sexual remarks about Ken is because the writers think that this is the kind of thing men do in reality. And sure, this kind of thing does happen, but with one critical difference. Men typically don't randomly speculate on what their friend's partner's genitals might look like whilst in the middle of a totally unrelated conversation with that friend. Meaning that the film has now given me two pretty clear references, leading me to conclude that the writers don't know how sexual harassment works. This is insane, you fool! And no, the fact that these inappropriate remarks about wanting to see Ken's genitals, or lack of, came from Weird Barbie, who is established to be kooky and quirky, does not mitigate how inappropriate these comments are. Barbie does not denounce what Weird Barbie said. At no point is Weird Barbie reprimanded for her perverted, objectifying, and demeaning comments about Ken. Weird Barbie is a protagonist in this film. Therefore, my only explanation as to why this is in the film is that the writers thought, well, you see, men do this in reality, so that's why Weird Barbie does it in Barbie Land. Anyway, upon arriving in the real world, Barbie approaches a group of men who all deliver zingers about how hot she is, because of course they do, and in her rebuttal she informs them that she does not have a vagina. Because she is a doll, and Barbie dolls of course do not have reproductive organs. You're right, except that Barbie and Ken were previously established as having no idea what a physical relationship is. I thought I might stay over tonight. Did you what? I'm actually not sure. And they don't even seem to know what kissing is, nor should they, because, again, they're not human. But this means I'm slightly confused as to why Barbie, a creature that does not have any comprehension as to what boning is, seems to telepathically know that because these men made comments about how attractive she is, this means they are interested in her because they assume that she has a vagina. I don't even know why Barbie knows what a vagina is. Vaginas do not exist in Barbie Land. Reproductive organs do not exist in Barbie Land. Barbies do not have sex and Barbies do not reproduce. They have nude blobs, as was so eloquently described by Weird Barbie earlier. Anyway, shenanigans ensue and we see soon afterwards that Barbie seemingly has no concept of money. Hey man, you guys gotta pay for that stuff. Even though in the opening voiceover we were told that Barbie has her own money implying that Barbie inherently knows what money is and what it is used for. Which means either that the voiceover and therefore the film lied to the audience, or perhaps more likely, that the writers forgot. 
And then we get to what is probably the strangest subplot in the film. The FBI contacts Mattel, telling them that two of their dolls have gotten loose and that they need help capturing them. What? This... Y Okay, so the FBI knows that Barbie and Ken are literally sentient Barbie and Ken dolls. As we are going to find out momentarily, the reason they know this is because this has happened before. The FBI also apparently needs the help of a toy manufacturer to capture them, because obviously if the FBI suspects a threat, they will ask toy manufacturers for assistance because they are incapable of apprehending two sentient dolls on their own. I don't really know what to say- oh wait, the guy from the FBI was a man, so he's an idiot, that explains it. Then things get even weirder. We learn that about ten years earlier, one of the other Barbies, called Skipper, travelled to the real world and tried to abduct a toddler, and the FBI then covered this up. So this means that ten years ago, the FBI caught Skipper trying to kidnap a child. At the start of the film, Skipper was living happily in Barbie Land, meaning that I can only assume that what happened here is that the FBI caught this psychotic and dangerous sentient doll trying to steal a child from their family and take them back to Barbie Land, and in so doing the FBI learned what Barbie Land is as well as what the Barbies are, and then they allowed Skipper to return to Barbie Land before covering the whole thing up. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Given what we have learned in this scene, I really don't think there is an alternative explanation. This is sheer insanity. But random, it's a fantasy movie, you aren't supposed to take it seriously. God damn it, retarded alter ego, that doesn't mean I'm supposed to ignore the information the film gives me. It is one thing to just leave massive holes in the setup of the world the story takes place in and expect me not to ask questions. It is another thing entirely to tell me that a Barbie tried to abduct a toddler ten years ago and the whole thing was covered up, and expect me not to use my brain to connect the dots that you have just presented to me. Anyway, the Mattel employee then goes to speak to Will Ferrell, who is in a board meeting. All members of the Mattel board are rich men wearing business suits, so of course they are all idiots, and he informs them that there is a Barbie and Ken wandering around California. Will Ferrell seems to also know that Barbie Land exists, presumably because Mattel were involved in resolving the attempted abduction a decade ago, and he is worried that if people knew that their dolls were coming to the real world as life-sized versions of themselves, it would be bad for business. Mm, no, so the reason this would be bad for business is because the one other time this happened it nearly ended in a child being taken from their family to live in Barbie Land where they would have died very soon afterwards because everything there is made of plastic and there doesn't seem to be any food or water. The last time this happened, a child was nearly killed. Anyway, they then form a plan to put Barbie in a box, which will solve everything for some reason. I honestly have no idea what the box is for, I guess it's just- it's- Barbies come in boxes. So Mattel apprehends Barbie, and Ken meanwhile returns to Barbie Land armed with some very dangerous and regressive ideas that I will get to soon. Will Ferrell asks Barbie to get in the box, but she senses something is wrong and she escapes. She is able to get past all of the employees of Mattel because, again, they are all men, and are therefore idiots. The one concept in the film that did successfully get my noggin joggin for the minute or so that it featured was when Barbie visited a girl thinking the girl would be like, holy shit, it's Barbie, you're my hero. Only to be devastated when the girl was like, fuck you Barbie, you ruined everything, you made a generation of girls hate themselves because they don't look anything like you, and you set back feminism 50 years. This was the one instance of the film being anything approaching intellectually stimulating, partly because the film seemed to be showing both sides respectfully. As Barbie comes from Barbie Land and believes that the real world pretty much functions as Barbie Land does, only for this kid to then explain why her entire existence has actually achieved the opposite of what she had thought. However, this scene doesn't entirely work because it involves a 12 year old girl lecturing someone on sexualized capitalism, unrealistic physical ideals, consumerism and environmentalism, and the girl's diatribe ends with her calling Barbie a fascist. Because obviously that is- it's something that you just kind of call people who are not in any way fascistic. This child seems to think that supporting capitalism and consumerism makes you a fascist, when in reality fascism is diametrically opposed to both of those things. It is possible that this child is misusing the term fascist because she is 12 years old and has no idea about anything, but given the way the scene is presented in that this child is eloquently and efficiently dismantling Barbie's presuppositions, shattering her perception of reality but eventually causing her to grow as a person, my presumption is that this was not the intent of the writers. The film does present and pay lip service to the impact women's behaviour can have on men. The entire reason why Ken goes off the deep end is because he is infatuated with Barbie, 
and his entire existence revolves around her, whereas she barely seems to notice that he exists. Ken seems to be a relatively nice guy, although the fact that he is single-mindedly devoted to Barbie is of course a red flag for her. And I will remind you of how little any of this means because, again, these characters are not sentient. What they are doing is a reflection of what the children playing with their Barbie and Ken dolls in the real world are doing. When Barbie and Ken travel to the real world, Barbie gets pissed off with him because he's an idiot. Ken then wanders off and discovers that in the real world, men run everything because men did a patriarchy. And so because Ken is a man and is therefore also an idiot, he decides, wow, this all seems nice, people call me sir. They do fist bumps and work out. They have big trucks and horses and bulging muscles. And I can tell women to shut up when they're boring me. I have finally discovered my purpose. And so Ken attempts to get a high paying job, but is rejected as he does not have a PhD. He then asks, isn't being a man enough? Because in Ken's patriarchy addled mind, he is deserving of that high paying job because he is a man. Oh boy, they are about to touch on diversity hiring. So, in response, the manager says, actually right now, it's kind of the opposite. Okay, finally something juicy. So, according to LinkedIn statistics, women are 16% more likely to be hired than men. This is likely due to the fact that there are many jobs that women don't typically gravitate towards, such as construction, mechanics, electricians, carpenters, agriculture, software development, manufacturing, etc. Because it is unacceptable for women to choose which careers they want to do, when a woman applies for a job in a male-dominated industry, the employer is more likely to hire them due to diversity policies, thus allowing them to place said woman in all of their recruitment ads and say, hey guys, look, we, got, we have a woman, look how diverse and inclusive we are. The writers of Barbie seem to be aware of this phenomenon, but Ken doesn't seem to be particularly happy about the fact that getting a job as a man in the kind of industry that men will typically gravitate towards is now harder as a result of preferential hiring practices regarding women. Or, in other words, discriminatory hiring practices regarding men. This hopefully isn't a hot take, but I think it is absolutely reasonable for Ken to not be happy to hear that jobs discriminate against men. But Ken is, of course, an idiot, and so everything he says and does is to be mocked. Upon hearing that men are less likely to be hired, he declares that they are clearly not doing patriarchy very well. To which the manager responds, We are doing it well, we're just better at hiding it. Here, the film is suggesting that 180 years of feminist activism and women's rights movements have not actually achieved anything. The men are just as evil, sexist, and patriarchy-y as they have always been. It is just less obvious because they learned to hide it better. This is kind of like suggesting that Germany is just as racist in 2023 as it was back in the 1930s. The Germans have just got better at hiding it, you see. This is a disgusting proposition that requires a malicious misunderstanding of history, and the only people who would ever accept such a claim with zero supporting evidence presented are the same people who are already predisposed to believe it. Additionally, the film is asserting that the men in charge are enacting preferential hiring practices favoring women because this is all part of the evil master plan that will ultimately benefit men. The surface level interpretation of what the manager character is saying might be that the patriarchy has decided that hiring women in a male dominated field will mean that the men in that field now have a woman that they can sexually harass. But I think the more sinister implication here is that the film is suggesting that even when women get preferential treatment, it is still a part of the patriarchy. You cannot escape the patriarchy. It is always in the room with you. It is hiding under your bed right now. Even when parts of the system are explicitly biased in favor of women, this still falls under the inescapably sexist umbrella of patriarchy. The patriarchy will never be defeated, and no amount of preferential treatment will ever be enough for there must always be something for feminists to complain about. Ken then leaves and attempts to get a job as a surgeon, and this scene was one of the few genuine laughs that the film delivered. I won't play the whole thing for you now, but it is in the trailer, so watch it if you want. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. Here, Ken assumes that the woman he is speaking to is not a doctor because she is not a man, and he assumes that no woman could be a doctor under the patriarchy. He is obviously mistaken, but because he is an idiot, he is unable to comprehend this fact, leading to the third act of the film. Ken is frustrated because he is unable to get a job despite being a man, and so he imports the concept of a patriarchal society into Barbie land, meaning that even in Barbie's rendition of reality that it has called the real world, 
even in a place so unbelievably pro-man and anti-woman, Ken was still unable to succeed on the basis that he is a man. He is asked for qualifications, qualifications that he does not have, suggesting that the film has undermined its absurdist parody of the patriarchy by confirming that, actually, being a man or a woman is unimportant. It is your competence and ability to do the job that is important. The film repeatedly leans on the loaded term patriarchy, but never actually explores what that word means, beyond the surface-level feminist interpretation of it's that thing that everyone knows is bad. In case you aren't following along, a patriarchy is a societal system in which men have a disproportionate amount of power. Patriarchy, as a noun, is morally neutral. It does not comment on why men may have more power than women. It simply describes a structure in which this is the case. A patriarchy could describe a society in which women generally choose not to work or pursue governmental positions of power. A patriarchy could also describe a society in which women are forced to be slaves for the sole purpose of reproduction. What feminists like to do is smuggle an extra bit into that definition, as a feminist will tell you that a patriarchy is a societal system which has been constructed so that men have a disproportionate amount of power. The feminist definition of a patriarchy, which is very clearly the one used in Barbie, has an inherent moral component. This is similar to how the term racism has become less and less useful as a word, as it is increasingly redefined in certain sociological circles as requiring prejudice plus power. Or, in other words, white people are the only people who can be racist because they have all the power. Which is an inherently provocative and divisive statement. It isn't really possible to discuss Barbie without addressing the concept of a patriarchy, but the film is not out to change anyone's minds. It seems to exist to affirm the worldview of people who already agree that the patriarchy is some evil boogeyman that has to be fought against at all costs. The film operates under the presumption that the audience has this received knowledge that women equal oppressed and patriarchy equals bad. Anyway, back to the plot. So Ken came back to Barbie Land and was like, hello, I have a patriarchy. And then everyone became brainwashed and he took over Barbie Land. Yes, brainwashed. That is the explanation we get. No arguments are ever given as to why a patriarchal society might be beneficial. No arguments are ever given as to why a patriarchal society might come to exist naturally, regardless of its benefit. No arguments are ever given as to why Ken would think bringing the patriarchy to Barbie Land is a good idea, beyond him being an idiot who thought it had something to do with horses. The film, or at least Ken, seems to think that a patriarchal society is one in which men drink beer and women tidy up after them. We don't see any specific changes to the law or any discussions between the Kens and the Barbies as to why Barbie Land was a matriarchal society and why Ken no longer believes that to be the best way to run things. We simply cut forwards in time and see that all the Kens are now acting how a feminist thinks men behave and that the Barbies are subserviently going along with this new lifestyle without questioning it. All we get is that Ken brainwashed them into becoming housewives with zero personal agency who heed his every beck and call, because, obviously, the patriarchy is bad, and therefore Ken must be wrong. Leading me to ask, rather inconveniently for the writers, whether Ken's brainwashed when they were happily living under the matriarchy at the start of the film. Well, this question is never brought up because it would of course shatter the sermon that the film wants to preach. One alternative perspective might be that Ken misunderstood what the patriarchy was when he was in the real world, and so the version that we see him instill in Barbie Land is intended to be a gross oversimplification brought on by him being exceedingly naive and unintelligent. This is an idea that maybe has some meat to it, except that what we see of the patriarchy in the real world is not too different to what Ken does to Barbie Land. The sole exception to this is the scene with the female doctor. With that one exception, the real-world version of patriarchy seems to be what a feminist thinks the world is like, where the spectre of patriarchy is haunting their every step. It is so absurd that I can't even entertain the idea that maybe Ken got it wrong, because he didn't. He copied what he saw. We also see that when things happen in Barbie Land, they can affect the real world, as when Ken takes over Barbie Land and his reinvented, kenned up version of Barbie's house immediately becomes a toy in the real world. And we see that it is selling super well and there are trucks leaving a giant warehouse with Ken's face on. This means that, for some reason, what happens in Barbie Land directly affects reality. This evidently means that the fact that Ken did a patriarchy and changed the house caused millions of children in reality to suddenly start playing with Ken dolls and buying the Ken house. 
This is almost treated like a multiversal butterfly effect, where changing one thing in Barbie Land has massive repercussions in the real world. I don't really want to say that this makes no sense, because that would imply that sense can be made of it. And the film never establishes how anything works or why it works in that way. It simply does. It's just magic. And whilst I can totally accept this concept, as this is clearly a fantasy film, I find it very telling that the world of the film exists as it does entirely and blatantly to facilitate the whims of the writers, and no effort is ever given to explaining what anything is or where it came from. The writers decided that Barbie Land exists and is populated by semi-sentient Barbies that are magically connected to the real world, somehow and for some reason, because, again, it allows the filmmakers to drive the story in the direction they want. This isn't necessarily a problem. Obviously fantasy settings are designed so as to allow the writers to tell the stories they want to tell, but usually there is some kind of connective tissue within the fantasy setting that ties it all together into something that is at the very least comprehensible, also known as world building. Anyway, the point the writers wanted to make is presumably about how influential toys like Barbie and Ken can be, and that if millions of kids started playing with a Captain Patriarchy Ken doll, then this would, of course, be bad, in much the same way that millions of kids playing with the classic Barbie doll might also be bad because of what that doll represents in terms of an ideal woman. Anyway, Barbie returns to Barbie Land and is not happy about what Ken has done. Her house has been transformed into Ken's house and is now filled with beer, sports equipment, and horse-related merchandise. I won't ask where any of this stuff came from because the only answer the film can give me is magic. So upon her return, the Barbies all openly state that they think what Ken has done to Barbie Land is great. President Barbie even proclaims at one point, this is so much better than being president, as she hands Ken a beer. They are all very happy with what Ken has done. How can this be? Well, they have all been brainwashed, you see. Barbie knows they have been brainwashed, because they can't possibly actually enjoy living in a patriarchal system. Because a patriarchal system is a system in which women have to obey their husbands, must hide their faces at all times, and shall be stoned to death if they look at another man. Oh shit, wait a minute. So this other character, who I haven't mentioned until now because she hasn't done anything, explains that what Ken has done to Barbie Land is like smallpox in the 1500s, as the victims had no defenses against it. Implying that, firstly, we must fight the patriarchy, so says our received wisdom, and secondly, that the Barbies in Barbie Land who are perfectly happy living under Ken's new patriarchal system are in fact his victims. He has afflicted them with happiness. He has made their lives better. And now it is up to Barbie to save the day and free them from their ecstasy. I also find it extremely amusing and bizarrely lacking in self-awareness that the film is suggesting that the reason the Barbies have all accepted this film's version of the patriarchy is because they had no defenses against it, in that they did not have the knowledge or cognitive skills to provide a rational counter-argument to it, without realizing the irony that this entire film is incredibly propagandistic in its glorification of feminism and demonization of masculinity, with the oppressed women seizing power over the men and oppressing them instead, and therefore the exact same thing could be said for young, insecure, and impressionable girls who go to to watch a Barbie movie thinking it will be a wacky nostalgia trip with pretty colours and funny jokes. Perhaps the target audience of Barbie has no defences against Barbie's feminist brainwashing. Anyway, Ken then declares that every night is boys' night and tells Barbie, not fun, is it? Referring to how she treated him previously. Suggesting that the reason Ken is doing what he is doing is not only because he wants to be treated with respect, but also because he wants to get revenge on Barbie for all the times she ignored him. This whole sequence had the potential to be effective, convincing, even compelling. But it is neutered by some very strangely placed comedic beats in the form of overacting from Ryan Gosling, accompanied by quirky editing choices and product placement meta-humor. Before I continue, I need to fill you in on a plot thread that I hadn't mentioned yet because it wasn't relevant. Barbie managed to find the person playing with her in the real world. To her surprise, it turned out it was a mother, not a child. Not only did the mother just so happen to live in California, where the portal to Barbie Land is located, but she also happened to work for Mattel and therefore was already involved in the plot, which is just staggeringly convenient. The woman helped Barbie escape the Mattel employees, and then she, her daughter, and Barbie all went back to Barbie Land. Now, you might be wondering why the woman and her daughter accompanied Barbie back to Barbie Land, but the filmmakers do actually explain it. Daughter says, Mom, are you really going to let Barbie take you and your tween daughter to an imaginary land? And woman then replies, Yes, because I never get to do anything. 
She goes on to lament the fact that she couldn't go on a cruise because she didn't have enough vacation days, and because her husband is allergic to the sun. Allow me to translate this for you. I am voluntarily working a high-stress job at Mattel because I am an empowered mother, but I am unable to deal with the consequences this job has on my ability to do what I want. I am somewhat financially independent. I am able to have my own career. However, I am also in the middle of a severe mental health crisis, and I am unable to go on holiday because I have taken too much time off. I am not going to suggest that women in general would be better off if they were stay-at-home mothers, but what I will say is that I highly doubt any of this would be happening if this character was a stay-at-home mother. Oh, and also her husband is a selfish asshole who doesn't care about what she wants. So anyway, parenthood is not doing what you want. If your mindset is, I am an empowered woman with a job and I choose what I do with my life. I can do anything I want because I am liberating myself from the patriarchy. Me, 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 fucking me. Then you are not mature enough to be a parent. Anyway, because woman just mentioned her husband, daughter then asks, wait, what about dad? And they both conclude that he will be fine while they are in Barbie land. Implication being that he either doesn't care about them at all, or that he is so unobservant that he wouldn't even notice if they went missing. The dad hasn't even appeared on screen yet, and the film is still making sure the audience knows that he is a terrible person. Anyway, the reason why Barbie, woman, and daughter travel to Barbie land is because woman never gets to do anything that she wants, so now it's her turn to have some fun. Alrighty then. This scene is arguably the most important scene in terms of narrative progression, because this is what allows the good guys to win. If woman never goes to Barbie land, Weird Barbie can't go on to deprogram the other Barbies. When writing characters, it is usually good to establish very clearly what they want. This firstly means that the audience is able to understand why a character is doing something, but it also means that the writers can use the character's desires to drive the plot. So, allow me to tweak this plot point. What if Ken had abducted Daughter? We already know that the inhabitants of Barbie Land seem to like kidnapping children. We also know that Daughter knows all about feminism, fascism, sexualized capitalism, and patriarchy. So maybe he drags her back to Barbie Land in order to explain to him how patriarchy works. This would also mean that the version of patriarchy that Ken instills in Barbie Land would explicitly be patriarchy as understood by the irritating know-it-all daughter of a mentally unstable feminist. So the question as to whether or not Ken misunderstood patriarchy would become irrelevant. This would also then give woman a very clear reason to go to Barbie Land, and it would inform us of her character. Woman would be forced to set aside her mental health crisis in order to save her daughter from Ken. She would be forced to travel with a stranger to a different dimension, whilst having no concept for what any of that means. For all she knows, when she comes back, thousands of years could have passed in the real world. All of this would show us explicitly how dedicated of a mother she is. It would allow the writers to reach the same narrative conclusion with regard to woman bonding with daughter, and it would give her an extremely clear justification for being in Barbie Land. What we got instead is that she never gets to have fun, so now it's her turn to do what she wants. And what she wants is to behave extremely irresponsibly and drag her daughter into another plane of existence because she believes the universe owes her something. So back to Barbie's meltdown, she tearfully bemoans the fact that Barbie Land used to be perfect, as did she, and says for the second time that she never wanted anything to change. She is then told by woman, Honey, that's life. Barbie seems to be magically becoming more human, both directly because of the magical connection she has to woman's depression, and also because she is magically able to cry, and that therefore she is forced to deal with change as a human constant. Because Barbie is becoming alive, she will have to experience everything that life entails. Unable to deal with this change, Barbie then gives up. She says she will wait for one of the more leadership-oriented Barbies to snap out of their brainwashed state and fix everything. Honey, that's life. That's what it is to be a person. No, that's what it is to be a woman. To complain about everything and then wait for someone else to fix the problem for you. It might surprise you that as a misogynist, I don't actually believe that this is what it is to be a woman. For some reason, however, this seems to be the film's perspective. And I know this to be a fact because we then get a cutaway gag where we see a fake advert for Depression Barbie. What is Depression Barbie? 
Well, she wears sweatpants all day and night, spends seven hours a day on Instagram, and spends her life eating sugar. And I am sure that at this point many women in the audience were cackling like hyenas because they were seeing themselves represented on screen. So, what could possibly be the cause of depression Barbie? Why does Barbie have depression? Well, she started having her existential crisis, went to the real world to try to fix it, believed that she had fixed it, and then Ken ruined everything by having a patriarchy party in Barbie's house, which then turned Barbie into a pathetic ball of passivity and pessimism. The film seems to be saying that Barbie is now depressed because of the patriarchy. And as the cutaway gag showing depression Barbie makes clear, the film seems to be suggesting that the reason why women often struggle with their mental health is because of the patriarchy. All right, now let's look a little deeper than the surface of the fucking ocean. According to the UK Mental Health Foundation, women are more likely to be carers, which can lead to increased stress, anxiety, and isolation. Women are also more likely to live in poverty, which can lead to isolation, although according to the Office for National Statistics, women only account for 15% of the homeless population, which I guess is the patriarchy doing its thing. No time for that now. The UK Mental Health Foundation also claims that women are more likely to internalize their negative emotions, whereas men are more likely to externalize them through destructive behavior. They also claim that women are more likely to experience physical abuse, although the Office for National Statistics claims that men are substantially more likely to be the victims of violent crimes. And men also account for 72% of all homicide victims. Female hormones also play a part. Women can, of course, experience postnatal depression, and they always experience menopause. So, after that quick roundup of the common causes of mental health problems in women, I will ask, how much of that had anything to do with the existence of a patriarchy? The only one that arguably does is women being more likely to be the victims of domestic abuse. Although this can also be explained by the fact that men are more violent than women, and generally speaking, men will partner with women, so therefore, with regard to domestic violence, obviously the women will bear the brunt of it. And this is further supported by the fact that according to the Office for National Statistics, men are the perpetrators in 82% of violent crimes. Meaning that, as I think everyone was already aware, the vast majority of violence is perpetrated by and against men. And yet the film asks, how could the patriarchy do this to women? Additionally, there are multiple cross-cultural psychological studies that indicate that when girls reach the age of about 14, they begin to exhibit far stronger emotional responses to negative stimuli compared to boys. This is all but scientific fact. Women are more emotional than men, and women experience a higher degree of negative emotion than men. There are a few possibilities for this. One possibility, seemingly endorsed by this film, is that when girls reach a certain age, they become aware that life as a woman is going to suck due to the fact that men run everything and women have no power. I'm a man with no power, does that make me a woman? As these studies have been conducted in every major continent, this means that the patriarchy is absolute in its dominion. You literally cannot escape it. Which would explain why women all over the world experience this same incline in their experience of negative emotions at around the same age. But allow me to posit an alternative explanation. Men and women are physiologically different. Their bodies have different purposes and it makes perfect sense for their brains to function slightly differently. For example, men are more analytical and women are more emotional. Not to mention that there are very obvious biological advantages to girls being extremely cautious, anxious, and protective in particular during their mid to late teens. Men also have very obvious physical advantages over women, which means that if a woman makes a bad decision, they're typically going to suffer far more than the men, which is another possible explanation for this defense mechanism. There are very reliable predictions you can make with regard to how a person may react in a given situation, and these predictions are reliably varied depending on whether the person is a man or a woman. So I think I'm happy to conclude at this point that whilst the presence of a patriarchal society may have some impact upon some women's mental health, the implication from Barbie is that the reason women suffer disproportionately from mental health problems is because of a rampantly and systemically sexist society. But let's go along with this premise and accept that men are the cause of depression Barbie. Men are the reason why women are addicted to social media, eat buckets of sugar, and lie in bed feeling terrible about themselves. What might be the best way to combat this mental health epidemic? Well, according to the UK Mental Health Foundation, it can help to talk about your feelings, keep active, and eat well. Or, in other words, socializing and exercising. I wholeheartedly agree. Socializing and exercising is fantastic for one's mental health. 
The problem, then, is that this movie has decided to demonize both of these concepts as part of the evil patriarchy. Men who socialize, take care of their physical appearance, work out and keep fit are the problem. They are toxic, they maintain the status quo, and they keep women down. Meaning that, quite ironically, if women acted in accordance with what this film considers to be the patriarchy, then their lives would likely improve by an order of magnitude, but far be it from me to suggest that feminism is holding women back, so let us continue. Barbie is then rescued from her bubble of catatonic depression by Weird Barbie, the one who sent her to the real world to begin with. This means that when Barbie decided to give up and wait for one of the more leadership-oriented Barbies to fix everything, this is in fact exactly what happened. Barbie was not punished for giving up. Nothing bad happened as a result of her failure. There is no lesson to be learned from this. It is perfectly acceptable to become Depression Barbie because everything will work out for you in the end. She is simply given a get out of depression free card by Weird Barbie and again later by Woman. Anyway, Weird Barbie decides to try and deprogram the other Barbies because obviously they can't possibly actually like living under Ken's patriarchy. And yes, deprogramming is the word the film uses, I am not making a joke. Weird Barbie asks why the brainwashing didn't work on stereotypical Barbie, who then theorizes that her exposure to the real world made her immune, or in other words, magic because her having visited the real world shouldn't have anything to do with her susceptibility to the concept of specific societal systems. Barbie then goes on to say, either you're brainwashed or you're weird and ugly. There is no in-between. Now, it is certainly possible that she is referring only to what is happening in the movie, as Barbie Land is the product of the writers of the film and therefore they have crafted it so as to adhere absolutely to their own ideas. The Barbies in this film have been brainwashed apart from Weird Barbie and apart from Stereotypical Barbie, leading her to conclude, quite correctly, that either you're brainwashed or you're weird and ugly. However, if we port this idea over to reality, and as with everything in this movie this is no doubt the intent of the writers, it becomes rather abhorrent. The film seems to be suggesting that if a woman partakes in the system, in this case the patriarchy, then she is brainwashed. There is no legitimate reason for a woman to be happy living under a patriarchy. If the writers considered there to be any valid rebuttal, then they could easily have had one of the Barbies explain, no, you don't understand, I'm not brainwashed, I just really like the way Ken is running things. But because this film is unbelievably reductive and simplistic in its depiction of both a matriarchy and a patriarchy, there is no space for this conversation to happen. And on the flip side, if a woman fights against the patriarchy, then they are seen as ugly and weird. So whilst a quick Google image search might support that idea, the film very obviously does not. Barbie and Weird Barbie are the heroes in this story. They are fighting against the system, they are undoing the evils of the patriarchy, and they don't care if they are seen as weird and ugly. They will fight the good fight and do what needs to be done to make sure all the women are forced to adhere to their worldview, even if they were perfectly happy living under a patriarchy. Maybe this is a deliberate parallel to the proposition that many women did not actually want the right to vote, but the suffragettes knew what was best long term and so persevered on behalf of all women, even those who disagreed with them. Maybe the film is going to make a comment on the fact that a handful of activists deprogramming the Barbies from their lifestyle in which they seem perfectly content is something of a moral grey area. Alas, because this is an interesting idea, the film is of course not going to explore it, and will decline to delve any deeper than the superficial. We then get a monologue from Woman delivered to Barbie so as to snap her out of her depression. This monologue is unbelievably blunt and it comes from a character who is struggling with society's expectations of women. As this seems to be a large part of what the film is about, and as this monologue serves as a motivation for Barbie to stop feeling sorry for herself and save the day, I think it is pretty clear that this monologue is what the writers believe to be an accurate representation of the life struggles that are unique and specific to women. When watching this part of the film in particular, I found it extremely preachy and absurd. And the monologue doesn't actually provide any answers to Barbie's existential crisis. The character in question just complains about how hard it is being a woman, convinces the other Barbies that they are oppressed and in so doing attempts to convince the women in the audience of the same thing, and then Barbie decides to save the day. To be clear here, from a purely plot mechanics perspective and from a thematic perspective, this scene functions. The point of this part of the film, if not the entire film, 
is to draw attention to society's conflicting expectations of and pressures upon women. Perhaps mirrored by the conflicting impact that the Barbie doll has had upon women, on the one hand empowering them by showing them that they can be anything, and on the other hand pigeonholing them with impossible beauty standards and rampant materialism. So the issue with this monologue is not so much that I find its content objectionable, it is more so that this monologue, like virtually all of Barbie's political messaging, is extremely oversimplified, is focused entirely on one side of the issue, doesn't even attempt to convince and simply preaches to the choir, seems to be willfully ignorant of how the world works by ignoring the fact that it is other women who are to blame for many of the struggles of women, totally ignores the fact that modern feminists are among the most privileged people that have ever existed, and is hilariously out of place by the end of the film once we get to the Supreme Court joke. Maybe my view here is clouded by the fact that I am not a feminist and I was simply listening to a film list off a load of buzzwords to make the insecure captive audience of primordial feminists screech YEAH THIS FILM IS TALKING ABOUT ME But I will read you parts of the monologue and you can draw your own conclusions. You have to be thin, but not too thin, and you can never say you want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but you also have to be thin. The implication of this is that women have to be thin for men, or at least for society, suggesting that the men who run society have decided arbitrarily that women need to be thin, and completely ignores the reasons why being thin is a good thing, as it generally indicates that a person is healthy, doesn't binge eat, has self-control, exercises, cares about their appearance, etc, etc. You have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. Implication being that men and society as a whole value women that have lots of money. This is false. Generally speaking, men don't care how much a woman earns. Men typically value physical attractiveness extremely highly, much higher than women do. Women, in fact, care far more about the earning capacity of their partner than men do. Many men may even feel emasculated if their partner out-earns them. The idea that society expecting a person to have lots of money is a uniquely female struggle is ridiculous. The only reason why women feel any pressure to earn a lot of money is directly as a result of advances in women's rights. 150 years ago, there was no pressure on women to have lots of money, meaning that the film, or at least this character, is complaining about a perceived societal norm that has come about entirely as a result of the feminism she espouses. You have to be a boss, but you can't be mean. You have to be a career woman, but also be looking out for other people. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas. Implication being that society expects women be career women, leaders, and bosses. If anything, it is feminism that expects women to do this. And once again, this applies equally to men. You're supposed to love being a mother, but don't talk about your kids all the damn time. Sure, this one I can understand being frustrating. If you are an absolutely dedicated mother who doesn't really do anything besides raise her children, this will obviously mean that most of your life is your children. And it would understandably be frustrating if all you had to talk about is your children, but no one wanted to listen. My presumption is that the vast majority of even the most dedicated mothers do still have hobbies of some kind, so perhaps this is more a symptom of women being typically more interested in people, i.e. their children, whereas men are typically more interested in things, i.e. their jobs and their hobbies. You have to answer for men's bad behaviour, which is insane, but if you point that out you're accused of complaining. This doesn't happen. Women don't have to apologise for badly behaved men. Some women might choose to, and I myself can in fact think of a time when I consumed slightly more alcohol than I probably should have, and so my wife no doubt apologised on my behalf. I am grateful for her doing this, but she did not do this because she was forced to by virtue of being a woman. She did this because she is polite, and because I had miscalculated how much food I should eat before consuming 10 pints and 13 shots. You're supposed to stay pretty for men, but not so pretty that you tempt them too much or that you threaten other women because you're supposed to be a part of the sisterhood. Implication being that women shouldn't want to be attractive, and that the only reason they bother putting any effort in is because the patriarchy has brainwashed them into thinking that in order to be successful, they must also be attractive. Ignoring the fact that there are very good and very specific reasons why more successful women are more likely to be attractive. And again, the idea that women have to be careful not to intimidate other women by being too pretty is entirely a problem born of other women. Never forget that the system is rigged. 
Here, the film falls into the classic feminist trap of assigning motive and blame to something as faceless as a societal structure, and it assumes that inequality and oppression are the same thing. If the system is rigged against women because they choose jobs that pay less than the jobs men choose, are pressured to be attractive, and are pressured to choose to have children over having a career, then the system is also rigged against men because they perform worse in school, are less likely to graduate from university, suffer directly because of support systems intended to help women such as preferential hiring practices, are substantially more likely to be homeless, have no rights regarding reproduction and abortion, cannot be raped by a woman according to UK law, are at a substantially higher risk of suicide, are far more likely to be assaulted, stabbed or shot, occupy a disproportionate number of dangerous job roles including the military, make up the vast majority of deaths in all armed conflicts that have ever taken place, and are between two and three three times more likely than a woman to fucking die before they hit 40. <clears throat> Sorry guys, the misogyny got a hold of me, I won't let that happen again. You have to never get old. Implication being that the patriarchy has decided that women are less desirable when they get old. Obviously, when women get old, they become less attractive to men. And this can be a problem because of how highly men value physical attractiveness. This is one reason why finding the right partner who won't leave you when you get wrinkly, getting married so that he can't leave you when you get wrinkly, and starting a family so that he doesn't want to leave you when you get wrinkly, has been the optimal mating strategy for women for thousands of years. But this is probably a controversial thing to say these days. Obviously, everyone gets old. You can do it gracefully, or you can cake yourself in plastic trying to look like you are 23 when you are 64, Madonna. That said, given how important female physical attractiveness is to both men and women, I can completely understand that women may feel they need to hold on desperately to their looks. Providing any kind of answer to this problem would be outside of the scope of this video, but regardless, the pressure women feel to not get old has nothing to do with the patriarchy. It is a biological reality. Men are predisposed to find healthy, fertile women attractive because that is what is evolutionarily advantageous. Never be rude, never show off, never be selfish, never fall down, never fail, never show fear, never get out of line. Again, all equally applicable to men, some even more so. Barbie could have explored, or at least presented, the issues that women face that are actually unique to women, rather than rattling off buzzwords. Because I have already acknowledged some of the issues the men's rights activist types like to talk about, allow me to balance the scales by giving voice to some of the issues that feminists of the non-crazy variety are concerned about. Women are on a fertility timer, which is absolutely not the case for men. Because of this, women have to have their lives in order years earlier than men do, because if they don't, they risk losing their ability to have children, meaning that they are no longer able to make that decision for themselves. And generally speaking, most women want children, most women have children, and most women who do not have children regret the fact that they did not have children. Additionally, women are also forced to make a decision in their late 20s to early 30s as to whether they are going to prioritize their career over being a mother, in a way that men do not necessarily have to. Women also bear the burden of pregnancy, meaning that their physical health is arguably more important than men's, and also meaning that if they choose poorly when picking a partner, they will generally suffer more than the men in those scenarios. A bad decision in early life can be catastrophic for a woman, when it may not be for a man. None of this is fair. All of this affects women more than it affects men. Women do actually have things to complain about beyond the patriarchy wants us to be pretty. The film never addresses any of what I just said, and my guess is that this is because you cannot mock and denigrate basic human biology in the same way that you can mock and denigrate a societal structure. And because Barbie, like modern feminism, is almost single-mindedly interested in complaining, this means that Barbie, like modern feminists, is more than happy to ignore things that it has every right to be unhappy about because there is nowhere it can directly lay the blame. It does not serve the goals of the writers to acknowledge any of what I just listed. Instead of exploring any of those issues, the film says, yeah, well, the patriarchy says we have to smile more and not be bossy. If this conception of reality was coming from a Barbie who just learned about the patriarchy yesterday, then I could accept this as a flawed understanding of how the world works. But this dialogue is coming from an adult woman. Given the purpose it serves in the narrative, I think it is more than reasonable to conclude that this monologue is merely the writers using this character as a megaphone so as to spout their political opinions into the willing ears of audience members just begging to have their own opinions repeated back to them in order to feel better about themselves. 
So anyway, now that the deprogramming is in full swing, the weird ugly Barbies enact their plan. Throughout this sequence, the Barbies trick the Kens by pretending to be damsels in distress, pretending not to know how to use computers, and pretending not to understand how money works. Alright, so the feminist heroes are lying by taking advantage of and exploiting the natural male inclination to help and protect women. Sounds about right. They proceed to abduct and deprogram the various Barbies by feeding them feminism. They literally, and I do mean literally, cure them of patriarchy with feminism. You have to be their mommies, but not remind them of their mommy. Any power you have must be masked under a giggle. You have to find a way to reject men's advances without damaging their egos. Because if you say yes to them, you're a train. But if you say no to them, you're a prude. We then learn that tomorrow the Kens are voting to change the constitution. What exactly they are going to change is unknown, as is the impact this will have on the Barbies, deprogrammed or otherwise, but because the Kens are doing it and because the Kens have snorted too much patriarchy, both the characters and the audience must immediately accept that whatever changes they plan to make must be pure evil. Barbie questions if Ken will like her after this is all over, and Woman tells her that she is justified in wanting to hurt him because Ken took her house, brainwashed her friends, and he wants to control the government. Barbie then responds, It's like I'm a woman already. I hate you. <sighs> this is exactly the kind of nuanced and applicable allegory that I have come to expect from this film. Well done writers, you pushed the nail off the fucking cliff. The problem with being a woman is that men take their houses, brainwash them into doing what they want, and conspire to control the government to serve their own ends. Sometimes I wonder if these people live on a different planet or if they are in fact fatally infected by motivated reasoning. So, Barbie visits Ken under the pretense of making amends. She lies to him by saying that she would like to be his girlfriend in order to manipulate him and subvert him. Ken agrees and says, I'll play the guitar at you. And so he does. For four hours. Isn't this funny? This is exactly what men do. And it turns out that the Barbies knew this was going to happen. And as we see the various Kens all playing the same song for their Barbies, the voiceover says, This is the final stage of our plan. Give them their dream come true. And at the peak of their happiness, when they think you actually care about this song, you take it all away. The Barbies then, after four hours of indulging the male ego, start texting the other Kens so as to make their Kens feel jealous and inadequate. Man, watching these spiteful bitches manipulate and take advantage of their dim-witted boyfriend sure is empowering. Yeah, you break his heart, you trick him and lie to him and reinstate the matriarchy, woo! As a result, the Kens all start fighting amongst themselves, giving the Barbies the chance to fix everything and revert the constitution back to the way it was. Even though the Kens hadn't changed it yet, they were planning on doing that later today, but would you, whatever, it's all better now. Upon realizing that the patriarchy has fallen, Ken starts crying and hides in Barbie's house. Even though from his perspective, nothing has actually changed. The Barbies supposedly changed a law, and we're given no reason as to why this would stop Ken's patriarchy from chugging along. There is no apparent law enforcement in Barbie Land, and so the only explanation I have as to why Ken concedes defeat is that he is, of course, an idiot. He doesn't know that the Barbies were brainwashed, and he doesn't know that they are not brainwashed anymore. All he knows is that they did something with the Constitution. Anyway, the way this part is acted by Ryan Gosling, as well as the reactions from the other characters, is clearly supposed to be funny. <laughs> Don't look at me! Look everyone, isn't this hilarious? Captain Patriarchy just started crying like a little girl. The film is not at all on Ken's side in the same way that it is on Barbie's side. The film may occasionally pretend as though it is being fair to both sides, but it abso fucking lootly is not. When Barbie hit her low point, this was treated with an amount of gravitas. We were supposed to empathize with her and understand how hard it is to be a woman. When Ken hits his low point, we are supposed to laugh at him. Fantastically, accidentally, and ironically, reinforcing the idea that it is not socially acceptable for men to cry. Because when a man cries, it is often seen as comically pathetic. But according to this film, when a woman cries, they deserve pity, and when a man cries, they deserve ridicule. What an excellent thing to be teaching people. Anyway, Barbie then follows Ken inside and proceeds to comfort him. I think we are supposed to consider this scene to be an earnest attempt at reconciliation, partly because of the lack of a voiceover explaining how When Ken starts crying, he will have hit rock bottom. It is up to you to beat him into the dirt and use his face as toilet paper. But given Barbie's actions so far, everything she does is caked with manipulative intent. 
So Barbie apologizes for taking him for granted, and Ken then attempts to kiss her. Setting aside the fact that previously neither of them seemed to know what kissing was, is it reasonable for him to want to kiss her? On the one hand, he's a fragile idiot who is misreading Barbie's apology as an invitation to make out, but on the other hand, she told him earlier that she wanted to be his girlfriend. Then they had a fight, she has now apologized to him, and so he tries to kiss her. Meaning that Barbie has led Ken on in order to get what she wants, and now that she has got what she needs from him, she tells him, nope, sorry, you need to go your own way and discover who Ken is. Remember kids, women can be anything, because Barbie can be anything. You too can be the president, win Nobel Prizes, write books, become a lawyer, be a pilot, be an astronaut, and you too can be a selfish, manipulative, scheming bitch. Ah, wait, manipulative is a gendered term, sorry, womanipulative, scheming bitch. Anyway, when the Barbies return to power, they then claim not to want to return to the way things were, but to live alongside the Kens as equals. As President Barbie says, I don't think things should go back to the way that they were. No Barbie or Ken should be living in the shadows. This would be an agreeable sentiment if not for the fact that it is undercut by Alan, who is a recurring gag character in the film. He is the one single version of Alan in Barbie Land, and he is either ignored or treated as the butt of jokes by both Barbies and Kens. After hearing President Barbie say that no Barbie or Ken should live in the shadows, Alan says, and Alan, suggesting that he also doesn't want to be living in the shadows anymore. Uh, President Barbie then ignores Alan, which makes the film's conclusion about all living as equals hard to take seriously. The implication seems to be that the Barbies may have learned from their mistakes, but this falls flat on its face in order to deliver some more social commentary with the subtlety of an anvil to the balls, which I will get to very soon, oh don't you worry. Anyway, the Barbies fix the mess the Kens made because the Kens are all idiots and the Barbies are all doctors, lawyers, astronauts, and politicians. And in isolation, that might be fine because this is how the Barbies and Kens were established to be at the start of the film. But the problems come with some exceptionally heavy-handed social commentary, where the Kens ask if any of them can be on the Supreme Court, and President Barbie says patronizingly, Oh, I don't know about that. How about a smaller, less important position just for you? And the Kens are super happy to accept, provided they can wear robes. The narrator quickly subverts this joke, saying, Well, the Kens have to start somewhere. One day, the Kens will have as much power and influence in Barbie Land as women have in the real world. My presumption is that this line was inserted after the rest of the film had been written, as if to say, don't worry, her mask isn't entirely off just yet, suggesting that the film is, surprisingly, aware that in reality, women do have power and influence. And given that of the nine current Supreme Court justices, four of them are women, this seems to be more than accurate. However, this reassuring line from the narrator feels extremely out of place given the previous two hours that the film has spent making unbelievably blunt and misguided social commentary. This line does not fit with the tone or message of the rest of the film. You can't spend the entire film showing me how evil the patriarchy is and how moronic the men who uphold it are. Have the heroic Barbies defeat the patriarchy with the power of feminism? Have President Barbie claim to want to live as equals before moments later refusing to hire any men for the Supreme Court, only to then slap on some narrations saying, yeah, it's okay, it was, we, we were like this in the real life once too. So, okay, maybe this is a harmless joke that as the narration quickly communicates, was just a joke, and the writers do not believe that this is applicable to reality, or at least current year reality. The problems with this joke are that it implies that reality is an unbelievably sexist place. More importantly, it also confirms that now that the Barbies are back in power, they have no intention of learning from their mistakes and living as equals with the Kens. Which, I guess, is in line with the intersectional third-wave feminist mindset that equality is small time, power is the ultimate goal, and the Barbies are going to continue to oppress the Kens because men in the real world oppress women. And even more importantly, in-universe, it makes perfect sense for President Barbie to do this. If the Barbies are actually more intelligent, competent, and experienced than the Kens, which we have to assume is the case because they all have ridiculously varied and important jobs, whereas the Kens are purely recreational and don't seem to actually do anything, then it makes perfect sense for there to be no Kens on the Supreme Court. Why would you want Basketball Ken on the Supreme Court when you can have Physicist Barbie, Diplomat Barbie, or Doctor Barbie? This makes perfect sense in-universe. However, this does not map onto reality whatsoever. And throughout virtually all of the film, the writers have clearly tried to depict Barbie Land as an analogue for reality, but with the sexes of the people in power swapped. 
Firstly, the idea that the Supreme Court is a group of conniving men who don't want any women because they should be at home doing the dishes or whatever is absolutely fucking ridiculous. But for the sake of appeasing anyone who does believe that this is how the world works, I will accept that premise to make the point. President Barbie, quite reasonably and quite rightly, rejects the Ken's request to be on the Supreme Court. The Ken's wanted to be on the Supreme Court because they are Ken's rather than because they are qualified to do so. Or in other words, they wanted to be a diversity hire. Given that, in reality, the first female Supreme Court justice was appointed in 1981, this of course means that there was a period of time where the Supreme Court was occupied entirely by men. There are many reasons why this would have been the case, sexism is only one of them. But if you take this scene from Barbie as any kind of analogy for the Supreme Court in reality, then what the writers seem to be suggesting is that women do not belong on the Supreme Court because they are not qualified to be on the Supreme Court. The film is suggesting that the men who are in charge are rejecting the women from the job because the women are not able to do the job by virtue of the fact that they are women. That is, of course, not an accurate description of reality. And it is unbelievably ironic that the writers evidently didn't realize what their little feminist joke is suggesting when applied to reality. Barbie then becomes a real girl because she just kind of does. Presumably meaning that she suddenly needs to actually consume food and fluids in order to survive, because as shown previously, she didn't even know how to drink a glass of water. I am definitely thinking about this way more than the filmmakers wanted, because the line between the semi-sentient inhabitants of Barbie Land and real human beings is extremely hazy. Especially if a Barbie or a Ken can suddenly become human with everything that entails by simply wanting to. And as the film ends with Barbie going to a gynecologist, this means that she suddenly has a vagina, even though she stated earlier in the film that she did not, because she was, obviously, a Barbie doll. This is all thoroughly confusing and not at all explained, but again, it lets the filmmakers make the points they wanted to make, so I guess don't think about it. The existence and nature of Barbie Land and its inhabitants simply must be hand-waved as magic, which isn't necessarily an issue. However, when you start connecting Barbie Land to the real world with the Mattel CEOs and doing your social commentary and telling me that what happens in Barbie Land affects the real world and that all of this is somehow allegorical for reality, then things start to fall apart. Barbie is a Trojan horse of a movie. The advertising had me intrigued. I was expecting an extremely off-kilter meta-comedy not dissimilar to the Lego movie. I was expecting a goofy, self-aware, fish-out-of-water adventure film where Barbie and Ken explore the real world and all that entails. As the trailer states, if you like Barbie, this film is for you. If you hate Barbie, this film is for you. I, being a 31-year-old man, don't like or hate Barbie. I don't care about Barbie. Barbie has never occupied any space in my short or long-term memory. So I was not expecting to have any kind of nostalgia for Barbie and Ken, but what I was expecting was something a little different to your conventional modern comedy, given the content of the trailers. While watching the film, I knew something was wrong, but because of how quickly and relentlessly it bombards you with feminist talking points, I wasn't fully able to articulate why this film was so bad immediately after watching it. I was so distracted by the strange and borderline incoherent messaging that I didn't even notice many of the structural and character problems the film has. The reason why I enjoy making videos like this is to explore why I feel a certain way and try to make sense of it. I like being able to explain and justify my initial reaction, or in some cases, explain why my initial reaction was unfounded. The fact that I actually had to make notes in order to properly understand what the fucking hell this movie was actually about, as much as that is even possible, just goes to show how scatterbrained it is. There are layers upon layers of satire, parody, allegory, exaggerated jokes, political posturing, social commentary, and so much more. However, the film fails to tie any of this into anything coherent by the ending and winds up contradicting much of what I think the film was actually going for. Dissecting precisely why I don't think this film worked at all also required me to grapple with the idea of death of the author. I typically try to focus almost entirely on what is depicted on screen when I critique a film or a show. However, that approach doesn't really work with something like Barbie, as the various ways in which it attempts to be satirical or allegorical require that its audience is familiar with certain realities, or in Barbie's case, certain realities according to the writers. 
If an alien with no concept as to what human society is like were to watch Barbie, many of the film's problems would not be understood because the alien would not be able to comprehend what the film is trying to say. So whilst it might be an interesting exercise to try to view Barbie as an accidental parody of feminism, I decided that I would instead assume that the writers are telling the truth when they claim that the film is most certainly a feminist film, to quote Greta Gerwig. So, in conclusion, why is Barbie bad? It depicts men as vapid imbeciles and women as eternally oppressed vindictive harpies without appearing to acknowledge this. It seems to prioritize packing in as many feminist talking points as possible over telling a coherent story, and perhaps most criminally of all, given the apparent message of the film, it shows what could perhaps be most generously described as a rudimentary understanding of the issues that women specifically suffer from. The film is more concerned with demonizing masculinity, the patriarchy, male bonding, male self-improvement, and male behavior in general, than it is with providing any kind of constructive or thoughtful conclusion as to what might be the best way forward for both men and women. The objective of the film seems to be to convince women that they are lesser than men and that they need extra help to succeed because of how much harder their lives are, and no doubt many women will agree with that sentiment wholeheartedly, hence this film's positive reception. Imagine how this film would have gone down, however, if it was about men keeping women in the kitchen. Then the women take over after learning about the glory of feminism, and then the men trick the women, retake control, and put them all back in the kitchen. That film would be slated as being unbelievably reductive, mean-spirited, and misogynistic. And were such a film to ever exist, there is no way in hell it would ever earn over a billion dollars, as Barbie has done. Because, of course, this is a one-way street. It is okay when feminists do it, you see. Anyway, regarding the world and story mechanics, they are virtually non-existent. The nature of Barbie Land is fundamentally a mystery. The nature of the Barbies and Kens is also a mystery. These are both catastrophic problems because of the way the film tries to draw comparisons between Barbie Land and reality. The history of their interactions with the real world are only touched upon very briefly in a way that is simply incredible due to what it implies. Barbie is clearly intended to be a sympathetic character, as a representative of the other Barbies who then collectively metaphorically represent women in reality. However, she is a vapid, inconsiderate, manipulative, self-centered bitch. Conversely, Ken is clearly intended to be the antagonist, although I would hesitate to describe him as an outright villain, because the film makes clear that he did not have malicious intent, he was simply too stupid to realize what he was doing. And Ken is a vastly more sympathetic character than Barbie, partly because Ken is the underdog in this film, partly because Ryan Gosling is extremely good at playing a lovable boob, and partly because everything he does is completely understandable given the minuscule amount of history we get for Barbie Land. The film fumbles, falls over, and contradicts its own messaging in attempts to lean hard into parody, allegory, and the pretense of fairly representing both sides, all of which is ultimately undermined by the way the film ends. So, to sum up Barbie in one sentence, it is a peek into the mind of a confused feminist with a questionable grasp on reality, and the end product is equally confused, morally dubious, incredibly reductive, and ultimately a terribly communicated exploration of the struggles of women. Thank you again guys for watching, I know I said in my last video that the final autopsy for The Hobbit would be coming next, but that was before I saw Barbie. And as my list of notes kept growing and growing, I realized I had enough to say about the film to warrant a full-length video. Do let me know if you agree or disagree with any of what I have said, and thank you so much for your continued support. Please, if you have made it to the end, drop me a like or subscribe if you haven't already, and if you are feeling particularly generous, feel free to call me names in the comments. Thank you again, and I will see you in my next video.